That's an enthusiastic response. Must be Friday. Okay, just one thing at the top. Uh, uh, pleased to be able to uh, uh, to speak the, the, uh, to uh, a significant NATO exercise that's uh, about to kick off on uh, Monday. Strike Force NATO will kick off an exercise called Neptune Strike 22. Uh, Neptune Strike 22, it's going to run through the 4th of February, and it's designed to demonstrate NATO's ability to integrate the high-end maritime strike capabilities of an aircraft carrier strike group to support the deterrence and defense of the alliance. USS Harry S. Truman Carrier Strike Group will be placed under NATO operational control and serve as the centerpiece for this long-planned activity that fosters NATO allies' ability to cooperate and integrate effectively. Now, this will, of course, demonstrate once again that the alliance is a united, capable, and strong transatlantic alliance. The strike group, along with several other NATO allies, will participate in coordinated maritime maneuvers, anti-submarine warfare training, and long-range strike training. Neptune Strike 22 follows Strike Force NATO's participation in the workups that the USS Harry S. Truman's strike group went through uh, all the way through the end uh, of last year. And I might add that the planning for this exercise actually goes back to 2020. This has been uh, a long planned exercise. Uh, all, of the, uh, all of the training events will highlight the continual and steady progression of alliance cohesion in a high end and dynamic environment. And with that, we'll go to questions. Looks like Lita, you're on the line, yeah? Yeah, thanks, John. Um, that exercise um, in the Adriatic, is that correct? Question. Was it in the Adriatic? It, it'll be the, um, I mean, it's, uh, the, the carrier will be operating in the Mediterranean. Um, uh, and I, I don't have her exact location right now. She was operating in the Adriatic, uh, but she'll be operating as part of this exercise in the Med. Exactly where in the Med, I don't have that. I'd have to direct you to Strike Force NATO for more details. Did that get you, Lita? Can you address what conversations the Secretary has had over the past two week or two with allies? particularly um, any of those in Eastern Europe about efforts to sh um, perhaps shore up U.S. aid to them or support for them? Has he gotten calls from any of those allies looking for um, any new U.S. support? Thank you. As you know, earlier, he did speak with his Ukrainian counterpart, and we read that out. That's the only um, conversation uh, uh, that I that I have to speak to this week. He has not spoken specifically to uh, uh, NATO counterparts about capabilities they may need or may be asking for. Um, so no, no conversations uh, in that regard uh, to, to speak to. I would just say that, and I've said this before, uh, we continue to look at a range of options of, of, of uh, capabilities that uh, we might need to make sure are ready in case uh, our allies are looking for that kind of reassurance. Uh, and as I've said before, some of those capabilities can come right from inside the European uh, command um, area of responsibility or even from, from the states. Our job is to tee up options. Our job is to make sure that we're ready in case our allies uh, need us. Uh, and so the secretary continues to, to look at, at all those options uh, before him. But I don't have any specific conversations and certainly no specific asks by any of the allies to talk to today. Sylvie. Yes. Hello, John. Uh, you said that um, uh, this exercise was planned for a long time. Uh, did the, uh, the, the tension in, uh, uh, around uh, Ukraine uh, change anything in the uh, scope or the location of the exercise? Uh, I, uh, I would point you to Strike Force NATO or to NATO for more specifics about the exercise. It's, it's, it's their exercise. Um, it, it has been planned, as I said, since 2020. Now, um, if the scenario has changed over time, I, I, I don't have that level of detail. But I would tell you that it's not 
it wasn't planned back in 2020, anticipating, uh, you know, a, a Russian move on Ukraine, um, and it's not designed, uh, the exercise itself is not designed uh, against uh, the kinds of scenarios that, uh, that might happen with respect to Ukraine. It, it really is a NATO maritime exercise uh, to test, a, as I said in my opening, to test really a wide range of, of, uh, of maritime capabilities that uh, we want to make sure we continue to improve. Ask another question. Uh, speaking about exercises, I'm sure you saw the images um, of uh, um, the Russian forces uh, deployed around Ukraine. Uh, is it in your is it your assessment or the Pentag the Pentagon assessment that this deployment is uh, um, uh, uh, um, <laughs> is logical for uh, a pure uh, pure exercise. Is it something that, for you, uh, correspond to a, an exercise? Yeah, you mean is uh, is the force label that he has yes. commensurate with what yes. you would think as an exercise? Yes. I mean, it, uh, the, the so. Probably a better question to put to the Russian Ministry of Defense to speak to their exercises, Sylvie. Um, um, I'll let the Russians talk about uh, uh, what these exercises are supposed to achieve and whether they feel like they've got the right capabilities in place to do that. I'm here to talk about what we're exercising, and in this particular one, Neptune Strike, and, and, I, and we can certainly talk about um, the, the significant capabilities that we're bringing to that exercise and the alliance is bringing to that exercise. But to your larger point, I would just say we continue to see um, a very sizable force presence by the Russians in the western part of their country surrounding the border with Ukraine. Uh, and it continues to be concerning. You heard Secretary Blinken talk to this earlier today. Uh, and uh, we believe that there's still a path to diplomacy here, and, and uh, we would like to see the situation de-escalated. And as I've said before, uh, one significant key way for it to get de-escalated is for the Russians to pull some of those forces back out away from the border with Ukraine. And that they have, they have shown no inclination to do that. In fact, quite the contrary, I think, you know, they continue to add to the force presence there. Now, what they're going to, what they're exercising and what they plan to exercise with, that's really for them to speak to. But, John, are you following these exercises that the Russian forces are involved in? No, I'm not. I, I'm not. I, I'm not going to speak to what the Russians are claiming are exercises. Um, uh, we're, what we're saying is they have a significant force posture there, and that it hasn't decreased. In fact, it has continued to increase, uh, and we remain concerned about that. But isn't it the U.S. government assessment that these are not exercises? Well, I think we may be talking two different things. Um, yeah, <laughs> well, no, you're talking about, um, I think you're talking about, uh, a Russian statement that at, at least a portion of troops that they had there, particularly, I think, they were saying maybe in Belarus are there for exercises. Um, so I don't. I think what the Russians are saying is at least a portion of these troops are for exercises. Again, I don't want to speak for them. You got to talk to them. We're seeing a sizable force presence there that isn't decreasing, um, and it continues to be concerning. And um, we have not. We have never classified uh, all that force presence as indicative of an exercise. I mean, they're spread out over a wide span of area, all the way from the south near Crimea, all the way around to the, uh, to the north, over the, across from the northeast border of, of Ukraine. Uh, and we're not seeing them all coordinating in some sort of large-scale exercise. We're not seeing that at all. And I think what Sylvia was also asking is the type of forces that they have and equipment in Belarus, is it indicative of an exercise or an invasion? I mean, the, the short answer is when you have forces arrayed, is that, is that better? Yes. Yeah? Okay. <laughs> when you have forces arrayed like that, they, they, they could exercise uh, and conduct exercises. Um, and those exercises could, in fact, be to improve their capabilities for an invasion or an incursion. So we're not splitting hairs here over whether the, you know, they're exercising or they're not. And again, I'd let them speak to what they're doing in terms of exercises that they claim they're conducting. We see a sizable force presence that continues to increase. Uh, there's no sign of de-escalation here, and so we remain concerned about that. And just last question, 
how many or what U.S. military equipment is en route to Ukraine right now, if any? Uh, I, I, uh, I think we'll have more to say about that. Uh, later on. Uh, we continue to provide, as you know, uh, security assistance to Ukraine. Um, uh, and I believe our State Department colleagues will have a little bit more to say about that uh, later. I don't have anything to announce or speak to, to today, or at least not right now. Nancy. Um, just a couple points I'd like to clarify. When you talk about how you're looking at the um, Russian force posture, does everything you say apply to their naval posture as well and the exercises that they've announced? Um, largely, when we talk about the force posture, I'm talking about ground forces. I'm talking about the, the ground troops uh, and the capabilities they have in the western part of their country, uh, around that northeast and eastern, uh, and quite frankly, southeastern border with Ukraine. That's what I'm talking about. Well, the reason I'm asking is they've announced a major exercise involving 140 ships, 60 aircraft. Is it the U.S. assessment that that is postured for an exercise, or is it also concerned that that could be used? in a possible incursion or invasion? Well, it's the same. I think the answer is kind of the same right. as to what I gave Jen. I mean, you know, uh, again, I'd let them speak to what their exercise. We're, we're speaking to our exercises. I would encourage the Russians to speak with specificity about their exercises. But, but uh, that they have significant naval force uh, uh, in, in the region is, again, not being not lost on us. Um, and um, certainly, uh, again, not knowing what Mr. Putin plans to do, um, you know, he has, to, he has a sizable amount of military capability, not just on the ground, but at sea. And then just a couple of clarifications on the announcement you made. Who precisely will the Truman go under the command of? It will be Vice Admiral uh, Eugene Black, who is uh, the Strike Force NATO commander, but he's dual-hatted as the Sixth Fleet commander. I see. So he'll, he'll command that exercise? Yes. Okay. And then um, the, the other thing, can you tell us which NATO partners are involved or how many? Yeah, I, I would re refer you to NATO um, uh, to get a, a, a more clear laydown of uh, exactly how many other allies, but there will be several other allies participating in this exercise. And I would remind you, not new to you, Nancy, but as we do conduct large-scale exercises, some people participate in some sections of it and not others based on their own operational demands and schedules as well as the capabilities that they're trying to improve. So for more detail, I'd refer you to NATO. And lastly, could you talk to, you know, this exercise is happening near where there are, as you note, um, a sizable naval presence from Russia. Why was there not consideration to delay this exercise, given that the tensions are there and there's the possibility for a misunderstanding of what these exercises are or could contribute to the tensions already in the region? Sure. I, look, I think we constantly look at exercises and training um, and um, and ask ourselves, even even after one's been, been, been worked on for months, not years, uh, you know, do we really need to do it now? Should we, should we speed it up? Should we shorten it? That happens all the time. Um, and there was due consideration about given tensions right now um, uh, about our exercise posture. Um, and after all that consideration and discussion with our NATO allies, the decision was made to move ahead. Jane. Thank you, John. Um, I think you may see in this report uh, North Korea, I think uh, on the North Korea, the, the North Korea and Kim Jong un said that. Uh, suspended nuclear and ICBM intercontinental ballistic missile test launch could be resumed. And also he warned that he could cross the red line. What is the U.S. Department of Defense position on accelerating North Korea's tactical capabilities? Well, obviously, we don't want to see the North Korean military program uh, continue to be able to pose a threat to our South Korean allies or to the region. So we continue to call on uh, uh, Kim Jong-un to sit down and, and, and discuss the, the, the way forward. We have said many times we're willing to conduct uh, diplomatic engagement with him with no preconditions. So. Um, uh, our, our view hasn't changed. We want to see the complete, verifiable denuclearization of the peninsula. We believe that uh, diplomacy is the best tack to take to get there, track to take to get there, and uh, and we're willing to sit down, no preconditions. What if a uh, diplomatic situation is not work? It's the next uh, step. I, I, I don't think 
getting into hypotheticals and speculating right now about what ifs uh, is, is very helpful. We've made our position clear. For the Department of Defense, I'm happy to con say, continue to say it. Our job is to make sure that, uh, that we are ready to meet the security commitments commensurate with our treaty alliance with South Korea, and we're doing that. One more question. Lastly, uh, China vetoed uh, North Korea's recent uh, missile launch at the UN Security Council meeting yesterday. Uh, do you think the U.S. need an independent additional sanctions against the North Korea? Or? That's not a question for the Defense Department, Jenny. Uh, that's really something better put to my State Department colleagues. Uh, these ballistic missile launches are violations of Security Council resolutions. Uh, uh, we continue to uh, call on uh, Pyongyang to, to cease that activity um, and for everybody involved in the international community to actually live up to the sanctions that have already been put in place. And not every country is doing that. Uh, and uh, China has influence uh, over Pyongyang. We know that. Uh, and, and, uh, and we certainly hope that they'll use that influence um, to the betterment n not only of them and, and the region, but to the whole world. Thank you. You're welcome. Megan. I have a question about um, vaccine implementation and discharges. So in, uh, on August 23rd, the secretary put out the memo saying that the COVID vaccine would become mandatory for service members. Um, a few weeks, from between a few weeks and over a month, it's like more like six, seven weeks later, the services started requiring, started adding them to that, the battery of vaccines that you get at basic training, which means that for over a month there were people coming into the military not getting vaccinated against COVID, and now they're being discharged um, either mid-training or finishing training without reporting to their first unit. So all of those tens of thousands of dollars to recruit them and train them are basically lit on fire. Is that put the, that implementation rollout and that delay between the announcement and requiring vaccines for trainees, is that an oversight as part of the impl implementation policy? Is that, is that the cost of doing business while you are trying to, to implement a new policy like this? What's the, you know, how did, the, how did this happen? <laughs> it's not that it... It had happened. Uh, you, you make it sound like it was some sort of happenstance. The secretary, as you go back, you look at that memo, he made it very clear that he wanted uh, a period of time to allow the services uh, to plan for implementation. I mean, this was a major rudder shift. Uh, you all remember when we were talking about it being voluntary and, and to, to make it mandatory, that, that requires process changes. It requires some policy changes, and it certainly re required the services to get to make sure they had enough stockpiles and that they had implementing guidelines for their subordinate commanders in place. And so the secretary felt it was only appropriate and prudent to give them uh, some time. And that's why he frankly sent that memo, say, it's coming, so you need to get ready for it. And that's not uncommon. We do that all the time when there's a major policy shift at the building. You got to give them time to get ready. And so we did that. Um, and and um, to your first point about, well, okay, you brought guys in when it was uh, in this sort of intervening period uh, before it was the mandate was actually in place, but after it had been announced, and is that a waste? And I would say no, not at all. I mean, we brought these individuals in in good faith um, and, um, and uh, want them to succeed in the military, and the best way for them to continue to be able to do that, at least in terms of their physical health with respect to the pandemic, is to get vaccinated. Um, and it's a back to what we said before, a lawful order. It's not uncommon for us to, um, to make vaccines mandatory after somebody has come in uh, when something new develops, and so it's part of being a service member uh, when you're when you're ordered to get a vaccine, you got to get that vaccine. So no, we would not consider this, uh, as you said, uh, what, uh, 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 some sort of fire or something. I mean, it's yeah, uh, uh, it's it's just the normal process, Megan. So we're talking about two different memos. You're mentioning the August 9th memo that was a heads up to the services saying, yeah. hey, I want to I want to make this mandatory. Everybody get ready. On August 23rd is when he said, OK, we're doing mandatory. But even before that, you know, you had said from the podium here in July, we're thinking maybe FDA approval, we're making it, we'll make it mandatory. And also for any of the services, 
it was always voluntary while this was, you know, under an EUA, but the expectation, if you are, you know, a leader in the military, was that this would eventually become mandatory. They could have started working on these policies a year ago, um, and they could have at least, for, for, for trainees, for recruits, on day one, on August 23rd, August 24th, said, okay, today we're going we're gonna to make everybody who's getting ready to ship to boot camp Acknowledge the way you acknowledge when you when mm -hmm. you ship that you're going to get vaccinated. Acknowledge that COVID-19 is going to be part of this requirement. They could have done that on August 23rd. They didn't. For the Marine Corps, it was they waited until October 14th, and so that was you know nearly two months of people coming to the Marine Corps saying I don't want to get the COVID vaccine, and now they're being kicked out because they still won't get it. That's what I don't know that people out. joined the Marine Corps and said, oh by the way, before I sign this, I'm I'm not getting the vaccine. I'm not sure how often that happened. Um, uh, I would just tell you that, again, that this was a major rudder shift here, uh, if I could use the naval terminology here, uh, and, uh, and the secretary felt it was important to give this, the, the services time to prepare for that and to be able to implement that. And again, Megan, I, 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 do, I, I do take your point, and I, I don't mean to sound like I don't or I'm being obstinate, but it is a lawful order. And, um, and uh, once you get it, on August 23rd, that's what I'm saying. no, but but uh, but that doesn't mean that it isn't still valid once it's given. Um, and uh, again, we would not consider it a waste of time to bring these uh, young men and women into the service and get them trained up with the expectation that after they take the oath of office and raise that right hand, that they're going to obey lawful orders. And I would remind the vast, vast majority are in fact. I mean, we're up over 91% of the active duty force now that's fully vaccinated. I mean, that's not insignificant. Pierre. We've seen in the last 24 hours attacks by ISIS in Northeast Syria and in Iraq. Any general comment on it? How cons concerned are you that there is a resurgence of ISIS in the area? Well, I, I would just say we're constantly focused on the ISIS threat. Uh, that is why we still have um, advisors in Iraq. That's why we also have still have a small presence inside Syria. The ISIS threat's not gone, and uh, and we recognize that. So, just without speaking to specific incidents, I would just tell you we remain focused on that. Okay, I haven't gotten to anybody on the phone, so give me a second here. Uh, Rio. Oh, thank you, John, for taking my question. Uh, Despite the deteriorating situation, the deteriorating security situation in Europe along the Ukraine border, does the secretary still believe the Indo-Pacific is a sole top priority and continue to focus on China? Thank you. Yeah, there's been no change about our strategic focus on the pacing challenge of China or the um, very strategic nature of the Indo-Pacific and our goal for a free, open, and secure Indo-Pacific. Uh, there's nothing changed about that, but. Obviously, we're closely monitoring what's going on in, in Europe. Um, as you've heard the president uh, speak to that, we're taking that very, very seriously. And as I said earlier, he's uh, making sure that uh, we have options ready for the president and for our NATO allies should, should they need them. Uh, Kasim? Uh, yes, hi, uh, John. Uh, I have two questions. Some European allies are sending warships to Black Sea. Is there a plan? to send some U.S. naval uh, capabilities to the Black Sea for now? Uh, specific ship movements to speak to. Uh, I think you know we, uh, we're pretty careful about um, uh, announcing ahead of time uh, uh, the specific movements into specific bodies of water. Um, if and when we have something to speak to with respect to Black Sea Ops, we'll do that. I will only add that, uh, that, it, that we, uh, we have every expectation of continuing to operate, sail, and fly uh, in international airspace and international waters, and the Black Sea is international waters. Ellen? U.S. and, of course, Western powers have provided some defensive weapons to Ukraine, such as javelins and stingers. But many argue that Putin would not use traditional Soviet tactics, generally based on heavy armored brigades and land forces. Instead, he would go with its advanced standoff weapons, such as ballistic and cruise missiles, to cripple the Ukrainian military's capabilities even before the incursion starts. In that case, wouldn't, wouldn't such a move negate or trash those defensive weapons provided to Ukraine, or is there any option on table to deter Russians from using those advanced weapons against Ukraine? 
speak with any great specificity as to how Mr. Putin plans to conduct another incursion, if in fact that's what he's going to do. I think that is a terrific question for our Russian colleagues to have to answer. Um, what I can tell you is that we remain committed to helping Ukraine defend itself uh, through a range of security assistance articles. That uh, so that assistance continues to flow from the United States. As you rightly pointed out, it also continues to flow from some of our uh, allies and partners. They can speak to what they're providing. Um, but uh, but we're, we remain committed to, again, helping Ukrainian armed forces defend themselves. Ellen from Synopsis. Hello, sir. Thank you for doing this. Um, I know that can we keep asking you over time? And I'm wondering if the answer has changed on this, but has the Pentagon, um, what is the Pentagon doing about the court decision on the seals and the religious exemptions from vaccines? Ellen, I don't have an update for you on that. Uh, we continue to uh, uh, talk about this with the Justice Department. We don't have any position to speak to today. Jeff Shogel. Thank you, sir. Uh, th uh, thank you. Following up on Nancy's question, the Russians are sorting more than 100 warships. Does the Pentagon have a, any indications that perhaps a submarine may be trying to defect? No, we, we do not, Jeff. Uh, Heather from USNI. Thank you so much for taking my question. Um, I was wondering if you could expand on what the U.S. will be bringing to the NATO exercise. Uh, the, the USS Harry S. Truman Carrier Strike Group. Um, so it's not just the carrier, but it's uh, it's uh, her associated support ships and the air wing that's on board the, the Truman. But uh, the real core for uh, this is a naval exercise. So the real core of our participation is uh, is with the Harry S. Truman and her strike group. Jeff Selden. John, thanks very much for doing this. Uh, Couple of questions. First, can you describe what type of support the U.S. and the coalition are giving to SDF forces in Hasaka, where fighting with uh, ISIS sleeper cells is now in its second day as they try to break people out of prison? And also, uh, the YPG is claiming on social media that it tried to send reinforcements to the SDF, but that Turkish drones intercepted those reinforcements and targeted them. If you have anything on that. Thank you. I don't have anything on the second part of your question, Jeff. That's the first I've heard that particular report, uh, uh, so I, I don't, I, I, I can't comment on that. Uh, on the whatever support the coalition has been given to the SDF as they have dealt with this or and continue to deal with this, uh, with this prison break, I, I can tell you that uh, that we have uh, provided uh, some uh, airstrikes to support them um, as they deal with this particular prison break. Uh, let's see, uh, Dong Sun Park from VOA. Thank you, Mr. Kirby. So former Defense Secretary Lobert Gage said January 2011, North Korea will use an um, ICBM within five years. And he said it would have the ability to strike Alaska or the west coast of the United States. So 10, 10 years have passed since the former Secretary Gage predict. So does the DOD believe North Korea can primitively strike the U.S. mainland with an ICBM capable of carrying nuclear weapons? That they continue to advance uh, their uh, nuclear ambitions as well as their ballistic missile capabilities. Um, uh, they test so they can learn, so they can improve. Um, uh, and we have, uh, without getting into specific intelligence assessments, we have every expectation that they do continue to uh, improve their capabilities, both in terms of uh, potential range and and and, uh, and precision. And obviously, uh, we're taking that threat very, very seriously. Uh, I think that's about as far as I'm going to go here at the podium. Uh, Kelly Meyer. Hi, John. Thank you for taking my question. Uh, Russia is putting 100,000 troops at the border with Ukraine. We're sending a written response to Russia. What kind of message is this sending, and why aren't we taking further action? Well, Kelly, I would tell you that uh, we, uh, first of all, I'm not going to get ahead of decisions that haven't been made yet. Um, uh, the message that we've been sending very clearly to Russia, and again, I would point you back to what Secretary Blinken said just this morning, is that there will be severe consequences if Russia decides to incur, uh, invade or conduct another incursion uh, into Ukraine. And uh, largely, those uh, consequences will be felt economically. Um, for our part here at DOD, 
and I've said this many, many times, uh, we're going to make sure that we have options ready to reassure our allies, um, particularly uh, on NATO's eastern flank, uh, if there's another incursion and if they need that reassurance, if they need the capabilities to be bolstered, uh, we're going to do that. Um, and we're going to make sure that we're, uh, that we're ready to do that. Uh, so uh, I, I think uh, uh, this is a whole of government approach. Um, it's not just about uh, the Department of Defense. And quite frankly, as you've been seeing uh, from other NATO allies who have also not only spoken to their concerns about what Russia is doing, but actually moved on um, a delivery of security assistance, assistance to the Ukrainian armed forces, uh, it's, it's not just — it's a uh, — it's an international community effort. Yeah, go on. Thanks, John. Uh, two questions. One. As far as Russia and Ukraine is concerned, is DOD in touch with any of the Russia's friends for easing the tension in the region? Any of Russia's friends? friends. Yeah. That's a pretty short list. Um, we, we are, we are uh, working very, very closely with our allies and partners uh, to make sure that, uh, that we're ready and able to, to reassure, uh, to show our commitment uh, to the alliance, to Article 5. Uh, and that's what we're focused on here uh, at, uh, at DOD. I don't have any diplomatic conversations to read out other than the ones that I've, I've already re read out. For instance, the secretary's call recently with his counterpart uh, in Ukraine. Um, but uh, one of the things your question raises is the, is the uh, this is the very real outcome of further isolation of Russia on the international stage uh, if, in fact, they commit another incursion into Ukrainian territory. They're just going to set themselves up for even more isolation from the rest of the international community. This is not a country that has a whole lot of friends. This is not a country that has allies and partners to lean on the way we do, uh, the way the West does. Um, and, uh, and one would hope that they would uh, understand that consequence as well, as well as the other economic potential consequences that they could face. Okay. My question, if I can, uh, please. As far as South Asia region is concerned, they are, uh, in Afghanistan, there is a humanitarian crisis going on, and uh, U.S. military and U.S. Go uh, left a lasting mark on the people of Afghanistan that they helped them before they left. Now China is trying to get there. Is there any uh, DOD help there as far as the humanitarian crisis going on because Taliban are now traveling different countries for getting help? The United States, and I think you've heard the State Department speak to this quite eloquently, we remain uh, committed uh, to trying to alleviate a humanitarian crisis inside Afghanistan. That's why we're working closely with non-governmental organizations and international organizations uh, to try to make sure that, uh, that the aid that the Afghans so desperately need gets to them. Um, and, uh, and we believe here at DOD, that's, we believe that that's the right process, that that's the right way to approach this, is through the international community and non-governmental non agencies uh, to make sure that that, that uh, aid and assistance gets to the people in need and that the Taliban facilitate that delivery uh, of those very necessary articles going forward. And finally, because the people of Afghanistan here in this area in the U.S. are hoping and also they are depending on the U.S. help for their people back home in Afghanistan. Any message for them you have, please? I mean, first of all, we have resettled now tens of thousands uh, of Afghans here in the country, and we, we have uh, several thousand more. But uh, that, we're, that are working their way through uh, the final process uh, to become American citizens and to move on. But uh, we at DOD have helped provide a safe and secure environment for that process to continue, and we're still doing that. And we're proud of that service. Uh, we know we have uh, here at DOD continue to have a moral obligation to all of those who helped us over the last 20 years. And that's why we also continue to work. Uh, hand in glove with the State Department task force uh, to identify and help relocate uh, people in Afghanistan who still want to leave and who still qualify for relocation. We continue to work uh, as part of that task force, and, and we'll do so until, uh, you know, until it's not needed anymore. Uh, we're absolutely committed to that. Thanks, okay. Thanks, everybody. Do you have any more you can tell us? First of all, um, just to clarify, was it solely airstrikes? Or were there any U.S. ground forces involved even in targeting assistance or helping on the ground or strictly airstrikes? My understanding is that it's predominantly airstrikes. I don't have any more detail on how many and what targets and all that. I'd refer you to CENTCOM for that. Yep. Thanks, everybody.